All right. Hello, everybody. This is Antonio Wolf. It's been a while. I might keep this short. Uh, I suppose I always say that, but <laughs> it never turns out that way. Uh, somewhat beautiful sunset today. Uh, I think I've been here before. Uh, yeah, I've shown you this place before. Or at least somewhere similar to that. Uh, so it's been a while. Uh, life has not been great. It has actually been a bit of a letdown. <laughs> we don't have much light left. Uh, I suppose maybe like 20 minutes or so. We'll see. Uh, family uh, health problems uh, have been happening, unfortunately. My mother has not been well. It's kind of been like one bad thing after another. Had a has been having some shoulder issues for years uh, that she was finally deciding that she would finally get operation for uh, this uh, well it was supposed to be around this time around September October uh, which ended up not happening because uh, about two and a half months ago she suddenly came down with an ear infection of the shingles and that really fucked her up uh, you know, when stuff infects your ear, it just fucks everything up. Uh, fucks your balance, uh, constant nausea, can't walk straight, dizziness. Uh, so she's been dealing with that for months. Uh, it's been slowly getting better, but uh, still pretty bad. And on top of that, uh, with the bouts of having to go to the uh, ER quite a few times, uh, this last week uh, she started having panic attacks, uh, you know. That happens when your life is going to shit and uh, you're stressed out about everything and uh, doctors decided to do an, uh, yet another MRA but this time they used, uh, decided to use some kind of stains because they, for some reason they thought well maybe there might be a tumor uh, and uh, they found a brain tumor so so far it's uh, on the outside outer layer of her brain um, it's uh, benign, but it could turn bad. So you can imagine uh, how she's feeling. And uh, she's one of the people I care about deeply in my life, so uh, I have not been feeling well either. On top of that, I had job problems. You remember last year I was doing trucking, and uh, this year I'm not doing trucking. Uh, one, I did not want to do long haul again. Uh, but uh, I did not manage to get anything local so uh, kind of back to a good old packing house uh, seasonal for now uh, did try to get a, a more regular job uh, like an office job uh, which I'm definitely more than qualified for it's just a matter of uh, how do you phrase things properly on your resume and uh, learn to say the right things in an interview which uh, I did get about four calls regarding uh, those. Uh, one of them seemed like it might go somewhere, but uh, it never went anywhere. So, uh, back to what I usually do anyways. Uh, even then, uh, honestly, we went like $21 an hour for uh, the position that I thought I would get. 40 hours a week, uh, that's only about 2400 a month. That makes you feel poor, honestly. <laughs> uh, you'd be amazed, like, what? You feel poor on that? You know, most people work for less. Yes, most people work for less. It sucks. Uh, I'm used to getting, you know, $1,000 checks every week. So, uh, there's that. Uh, anyways, that's just been my life. Uh, that's part of why I haven't been doing videos. Uh, the other part is just like uh, my mind was not in it. Uh, even uh, before all this stuff came down with my family. And before I was worried about the job. I think I've gone out and maybe tried to do a video about six times. You know, maybe once a month almost. Uh, for the first half of the year anyways. 
and every time I went out it just kind of went to nowhere I did not feel that the video was any good so I never uploaded it uh, various topics but uh, that's that uh, things on my mind one of the things I well you would know if you're on the discord but if you're not you wouldn't know and uh, yeah I haven't posted it anywhere else uh, there was a there's a book that I've been working on long term um, on how to just the Imperian Trail which is supposed to be an introduction to Hegel's philosophy and method particularly just like the most broad generalities of it uh, still with structural detail which I like uh, which is something that, uh, you know, four years ago uh, I thought was a waste of time, but nowadays I think uh, it's worth a little bit of something. So uh, there was a, about a 30 page manuscript that I had from about four years ago, uh, and I ended up turning that into about a, almost 90 pages over about a month, uh, around April to May. Uh, it's near complete, really. Uh, I don't really want to... I'm actually looking to cut it down. I did not want it to be so long. And uh, so the plan has changed uh, drastically. Uh, the style has changed cause, because it was kind of a collation of various articles I already had written and just kind of brought them together in an order and cleaned them up to be more coherent with each other. Uh, but uh, with the focus changing, that changed. Uh, quite a bit as well. Along with that, uh, I ended up taking about a, a good chunk of that was a set of other essays which are more... If you remember the stuff in the gods, uh, the arguments for the existence of God, uh, the free will stuff, the uh, arguments on truth, the objective morality stuff, that is not Hegelian stuff. Uh, it is more of a presenting speculative philosophy in a certain more dogmatic, formalistic uh, presentation, but still intelligible to an intelligent person. That's normal. You know, not one of these like psychopathic, idiotic, uh, educated, stupid people that you find online and many other places. Uh, so that's about a 30-page chunk on its own, and actually it's going to be longer because uh, it's supposed to be a manuscript that kind of also collates these not yet written things, but things that I wrote, did a workout on slides, and so you just kind of transform them into essays uh, for introducing, well, what I think are the basic problems and answers to philosophy. So uh, if you're interested, let me know. Put it in the comments. I might post it. Uh, it's unfinished. I don't know what I'll do with it when I finish it. Uh, I might just put it out for free, but it seems people respect things less when they're free. <laughs> you know, uh, I don't fucking understand how people do uh, judge things. But I may put like a $2 price tag on that if people give a fuck. Uh, basically free. <laughs> You're buying me not even a coffee these, at that point. But whatever. Uh, it's just so, so information gets out there. Uh, other things. Well, this morning I was, uh, I worked seven days this week, by the way. <laughs> I think it's around, somewhere around 66 hours, maybe 70, who knows. Uh, I actually don't keep track. It's been like 11 to 12 hour shifts every day, so worked about six hours a day. It might be about 70 hours. Uh, which I don't mind, I mean, uh, a check is a check, and I really need money. Uh, I'm not broke. I'm nowhere near broke compared to most people, but uh, I feel broke. Uh, and I've got life expenses to take care of. Uh, anyway, so I was, uh, I fell asleep listening to uh, uh, a set of summary, a summary presentation about like four hours long on Heidegger. Uh, I skipped the one on being in time because I don't find being in time interesting, honestly. I find it kind of eh. Don't really care. Uh, later Heidegger is more interesting to me, so I was listening to the second set of uh, presentations, or, well, it's a single presentation that's four hours long, on Heidegger, and uh, all I could think was, this is Hegel. 
this is just Hegel, German idealism, done by somebody who is obstinate about joining that club. Uh, because, boy, everything that Heidegger says about truth, that was said by people like Hegel, it was said by people like Fichte. People like Schelling, it was shit, it was said stuff said even by Neoplatonists. Um, one of the things that uh, Heidegger plays up a lot is like, oh, you know, people forgot the question of being. Oh, that's total bullshit. Uh, anybody who knows anything about the history of philosophy will tell you that. Uh, people never confused being and beings. The being of beings was always made uh, distinct. The ontological difference was not overlooked. Uh, you know, medieval philosophers were very well aware of it. Uh, Neoplatonists were very well aware of it. Uh, nobody ever forgot it. Uh, well, it's not that nobody forgot it. It's just like plenty of people did forget it. It just happens to be that those people are not the famous people that you know of these days. So, there's that. Uh, the whole thing about uh, Alicia, uh the more uh, I listen to that, I'm about an um, hour, two hour, hour and a half. Two hours in, I think. Uh, and the more I hear about what he says about it, fuck, it's just what Hegel says about truth. It's just what Fichte says about truth. Like, it's not original, man. Uh, it's insightful, I'll tell you that. Uh, I certainly was smiling, and uh, it's certainly exciting to see that somebody else, on their own, because I think Heidegger is that kind of guy who's like stuck up and doesn't like to... Even though he did read other people... He didn't really pay much attention to what they intended. He just kind of superficially read them through himself, which is a well-known thing that he did. Uh, so even though like he did read plenty of other people's, and one could say, "Oh, well, he stole these ideas, you know, from all these other people," I don't think he actually did. I don't think he just. I think he didn't really pay attention. He just kind of developed these things on his own, uh, which you know, there's people like that. Uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Quite frankly, uh, to an extent, I do that. Uh, to an extent, uh, I just want to think things for myself. I don't care what anybody else says, uh, even Hegel and other things. Out in the countryside, there's all kinds of animals, and I just kind of hear something to my right that sounds a little bit odd, but who knows? Anyways. The point is, uh, in a way it's exciting, in a way it's kind of uh, sad that someone could be so close to the truth and yet be so far, all because they are obstinate and just do not want to accept, you know, that the things that other people are talking about is the same thing you're talking about uh, and that uh, these judgments that you had at first are not exactly true. You know, apparently, uh, I forget from who, I think it's from Niederhauser, uh, who, uh, I heard this from, that my, uh, Martin Heidegger struggled with Hegel up until the end of his life. He kind of just kept coming back and forth of whether, like, you know, like, if you read his early stuff on the phenomenology and science of logic and him commenting on it, he was like, oh, well, you know, Hegel's goes wrong in here and that. Uh, but in his private notes and throughout his lectures, he keeps coming back and forth between suddenly realizing, no, you know, Hegel was not as simple as I thought, and, and uh, he was actually quite right. You know, he realizes that Hegel was uh, not confusing being and beings. Hegel certainly knew about the onto ontological difference, or is it, what is it, the ontic difference? Uh, he realizes that uh, the nature of thought that he has later on is also what Hegel like realizes as well with the logic that the, the logos is far broader than just representational thinking. Uh, he realizes the importance of historicity, though I don't see like a, I don't know if he like really gives much importance to Hegel. Though the one guy I know that's kind of like highly influenced by Heidegger was his uh, Dr. Jason Reza Giorgiani. Uh, the way he writes about Heidegger just makes it seem like, you know, sort of a, a worse form of uh, Hegel's philosophy of history. Which, eh, you know, it's not too bad, I suppose. But, you know, when you got somebody who's worked it out and he's, they've done it better than you, uh, 
I think that's kind of a, a failure. Uh, the stuff on Aletheia, you know, the unconcealment of being, uh, particularly in the... I'll link the, the series that I'm watching. Well, it's not a series. It's just one long-ass presentation video. Uh, not much analysis, not much, you know, deeper explanation. It's just kind of presentation, superficial, like, uh, presentation of ideas. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, there's not many videos of that kind. <laughs> you know, thank God for uh, the obsessive autists out there <laughs> who do things like that. You know, I wouldn't do it for Hegel. I, I have a different style, but I'm glad that there are people who do that. Uh, but anyways, uh, apparently uh, Heidegger in his later period comes to realize that the importance between uh, being and seeming and that this distinction between uh, being and seeming, you know, or being and appearance, that this dichotomy between one being real, the other one being uh, not at all, you know, just a complete falsehood, uh, an illusion, whatever, uh, was part of what, you know, led people astray. And uh, the German idealist and the Neoplatonist would certainly agree that uh, the way things seem is part of the way things are. And so, you know, Heidegger's whole thing is like, well, you know, uh, seeming is not all that things are, but it is part of what things are, and so if we are to get at what things are, we're to get at their truth, uh, they have to show themselves, and the first showings are going to be seemings. Uh, it's not until you get a totality of seemings that you get, you know, the unconcealment of things as they are. Uh, and that uh, the one thing that Heidegger lacks that Hegel and the German idealists have is Heidegger lacks what the final structure of unconcealment and its totality is you know Heidegger says well you know being unconceals itself through seemings and you know we got to go through them and uh, each epoch each era has a certain kind of framing in which seemings uh, are taken to be and what is taken to be that it is or what is conceived to be the possibility of being what it is to be uh, that those change and whatnot. But Heidegger never gets to a sense of, well, uh, what makes for a true being in the first place. We know that the truth is going to be the unconcealment of things themselves to us. And that, you know, part of our, our relationship as knowers, in a conceptual sense, uh, through our reason, and I don't think he means it in a conceptual sense, but I'm adding that, um, is part of the very true being of things you know that their part of their being is to unconceal themselves to reasoning beings like us but uh, beyond the constant uh, change of things and the way in which everybody's contextualized given a historical contingent uh, existence of a sort yeah, Heidegger doesn't have a concept of what would be a true truth. He just knows that the process of truth has to be a process of letting things be, letting them uh, reveal themselves to us, unconceal, and uh, I suppose then you enjoy. Uh, take joy in the unconcealment of things, in the imbibement of the truth. And in some way, this is connected to freedom, and uh, apparently Heidegger directly says this, that uh, freedom is essential to this, or part of things is freedom of this kind, the freedom of unconcealment, the freedom to let things be, and for us to be along with them. Uh, and when you think about that, it's a, it's a beautiful thought. It's a, you know, people go like, oh, Heidegger's a Nazi. Uh, well, he was, but... Uh, it's kind of like, so what? <laughs> doesn't make what he says uh, false. Uh, doesn't make it less interesting. Uh, besides, I mean, as far as Nazis go, uh, his reasonings are very different to uh, people who ran uh, the deeper part of the Nazi party. And uh, as a matter of fact, I don't think Heidegger was very aware of what those people really believed. Uh, many people aren't aware of what those people really believe. They were fucking weird. You know, it's not just some political ideology. People are like, oh, it's fascism. Um, no. 
Uh, the Nazis were a very weird religious, esoteric, occult group that uh, went far beyond a political ideology. why I would not rank them as uh, the same as Italian fascists, and I would hardly call them fascists. I mean, uh, if you want to call, like, Plato's Republic fascist, uh, sure. Uh, that's kind of what, it's kind of what the Nazis were, in a way, hoping to do in an updated form. Uh, and indeed, some people do call them that, you know, what's his name? Karl Popper does. I mean, I told you there was about 20 minutes of daylight left, and, uh, I happen to be right. Uh, it's actually brighter on the camera because this camera picks up a bit more uh, on low light than our natural eyes do. But uh, that's what's been on my mind today. Uh, let's see, to mention some of the videos that I failed to uh, upload. <laughs> Uh, I had done one commenting on the Gaza-Israel thing, uh, ultimately I decided not to. Uh, it's a topic that's not worth commenting on, quite frankly. Uh, if you see my Twitter, you know where I stand. I don't have to say anything. Uh, if you've been on Discord, you know where I stand. Uh, I'm definitely uh, pro-Palestine. Uh, you know, would you say, well, that doesn't necessarily make you anti-Israel. You know, some people will say stuff like that. No, it makes me anti-Israel. Uh, you know, against other people, like, well, Israel has a right to defend itself. States have no rights. <laughs> you know, people don't have a right to land. That's bullshit. Um, you have rights insofar as you can make yourself an autonomous state. Uh, if you can't and you are parasitic on other states, sucks to be you. But, you know, uh, you're a fake country. That's basically it. Israel's a fake country. Currently, Palestine is a fake country. But uh, Palestine, seemed, if you know, left to uh, that area without U.S. and European interventions, I don't know that uh, Palestine couldn't come out as an actual autonomous uh, country, a state. Uh, would it be a very good one? Probably not. Uh, but, you know, uh, with those kinds of things, uh, it's uh, blood and soil. Yeah, those willing to die are the ones who get it. Uh, as far as the atrocities being committed, yes, there are atrocities. Uh, I held off on like, the, calling it a genocide for a while because, well, people just shoot out words like that. Uh, you know, uh, it's... Moral outrage, uh, you know, virtue signaling, and I, I don't like that stuff. But uh, you know, it's estimated that uh, more than two hundred thousand people are dead uh, in Gaza. Over, you know, a thousand. Yes, I'm putting that in air quotes because I don't buy it. Uh, Israelis, uh, who weren't just any Israelis, you know, they were all. A lot of these people were former military, and they were having a party right next to the wall. You know, right next to a <laughs> a giant concentration camp called the Gaza Strip. Uh, not very smart. You know, that's like dressing yourself in meat and uh, going into a lion's den. Uh, I can't feel sorry for you. You know, there's a, a certain kind of stupidity that uh, gets what it gets. Uh, and second. Uh, <laughs> Around half of the people were killed by Israel themselves. You know, uh, if you haven't heard of that, you should look it up. Uh, even Israel admits to it now that, uh, you know, their own military freaked out and uh, gunned down their own people. So, uh, yeah, fuck Israel. That's all I've, I've got to say about that. Uh, if any of you support them, get mad all you want. Post all your uh, links with uh, IDF propaganda and uh, pseudo-history all you want, uh, I don't care. <laughs> I've had the discussion before, you know, like, people are blinded. 
people are blinded, uh, you know, and then we all pretend that we're gonna be the ones who are not blind, but in this case, most of the world, and I mean most of the world, something like 80% of like all the countries like look out at what's happening and just uh, see it for what it is. And they're aware of the history and uh, what Israel and the United States and Europe say it doesn't matter because it's fake. It's just made up. So, uh, yeah, I had made a video commenting on that, particularly about the problem of evil and uh, how that relates to that. And I decided... Uh, it just was not in good taste, ultimately. Uh, not that it wasn't fitting, it's very fitting. I mean, what else would there be to, to give us a good example of, uh, what's the word, uh, theodicy? Uh, then, you know, something that every, almost everybody agrees is terrible right now. Uh, but not in good taste, so I decided not to upload that. Another one was, uh, uh, a few months ago, I think now, uh, a couple months at least, that I had uh, wanted to do a talk on uh, uh, Hegelianism in life, uh, what Hegelianism adds to life, to personal life. Uh, nobody showed up on Discord, uh, so uh, that went nowhere. Uh, and, you know, I'm not going to, like, talk to myself, uh, one of my friends, and, you know, uh, one person that showed up an hour late. Uh, so I decided, well, I might just like do a walk and talk video, and uh, I tried that, and uh, I just rambled too much. Uh, it went nowhere, uh, so I decided not to upload that. Uh, along with that was, uh, actually, I've done various videos uh, trying to give a talk on uh, Franz Kafka's The Trial, and... Uh, Maybe all I can say about that, let me take a seat for a sec. All that I can say about that, honestly, is uh, that book has deeply impacted my life. Um, it is a wonderful book, uh, story. Uh, it is a true story uh, in the speculative sense. Not that it's empirically true, but uh, that it's rationally true. Uh, it is... It expresses something deeply meaningful on that level. And, you know, there's insects getting on my camera. On my phone, actually. Um, there's probably some rabbits down there that I keep hearing, like, moving, rustling. But... Uh, it's been about four years, I think, since I first read it. Uh, and might have mentioned it. And uh, it struck me since the first time, and I've listened to it quite a few times afterwards. And uh, then I did the readings, and actually before I did that reading that I recorded on, put on YouTube as the uh, commentary series, uh, a few months before that I had listened to it about, I think that the third time, but really the second time that I've listened to it like fully awake, because most of the time I listen to it falling asleep, honestly. So you miss details and stuff. So a lot of details came forth in that. And uh, uh, the book actually pushed me to uh, self-reflect about the ways in which I run away from responsibility in life by assuming that I know what is going to happen already without any actual reason uh, to say that I actually know. So, you know, one of the things was that with my parents, uh, I have issues, difficulty communicating. Uh, you know, out of, well, uh, my parents are cold people. Uh, I'm a cold person, relatively speaking. Uh, as far as expressing emotions uh, to family and friends. But things that you know everybody wants is you want to have a relationship with your parents you know your part you want you you want to know your parents and you want your parents to know you and uh, you know that's a, a bit of pain that uh, is constantly in my life to an extent and so uh, due to the book I actually went home that day uh, after do, doing a video that was uh, back when I went to Monterey it was that two-part video on that day so back when I went home, uh, 
that day actually. And I went. I decided. Well, I don't want to be like Kay. You know, I don't want to go about my life making mistakes because I assumed I knew what would happen when I don't. Uh, you know, avoiding important things because I already assumed that they're, you know, uh, not worth doing. That you know, it's hopeless. So. Uh, that was that. That that was a, a big impact on my life, you could say. Uh, and I do come back to that every once in a while. It always reminds me of that. Uh, to keep struggling, you know, doing it once for a little bit uh, is not enough. Uh, you know, it's take incremental little steps, but you still have to force yourself to keep making those steps. Uh, I actually read the. Well, I didn't read. I listened to the audiobook of. Though I did read uh, half of it. Actually, about two years ago, uh, the castle, which is you know the second story that follows the exact same theme as the trial, just inverse. Uh, I liked it. Uh, yet again, it's one of those cases in which you know Kafka is really a master of symbolism and metaphor, and he doesn't tell you stuff. Uh, uh, and actually, the castle is written after the trial. Uh, he gives up on the trial, doesn't finish it, starts the castle, doesn't finish it either. And the castle is... The castle feels like it's only about three-fourths complete. That there was supposed to be one quarter more of that book. And the three-fourths complete is already two times longer than the trial. Which makes you realize that... Uh, the chapter that it ends on... Uh, it ends on a fragment as well. He kind of started rambling. Uh, he kind of lost... He seemed to have lost sight as to where the story was, what was the coherent concept. Too many things were coming in, too many characters, too many side plots. Uh, and uh, the thing that he didn't do in the trial, but which he did in the castle, is he explained too much. There are at least two chapters where, I don't know, unless you're not very good at thinking, you're not very aware, uh, he straight up tells you what is the meaning behind everything going on. And it's theological, just like in the trial. It's just straight up, clearly metaphors for religion and God. Uh, and just like in the trial, you could only misunderstand this as being a critique or bad if, well... They're kind of superficial dunce. Uh, so if, if you never read it, you should probably give it a read. Uh, if you like thinking about things or like thinking through things, really, you should give it a read. Uh, I recommend it. Uh, I listened to the audiobook of Neuromancer. I also listened to the radio play by the BBC on it. And uh, I've said this before, I don't say it very often, that fantasy and sci-fi are basically inverted, the inversions of the same theme. Fantasy is ultimately about God, and sci-fi is ultimately about God too. Uh, like, the top tier sci-fi always ends up being about God. Top tier fantasy always ends up being about God. You can't get away from it. Atheists and theists alike will end up making it about God no matter what. There's nothing more interesting. You know, either it's an AI God or, or like machine God or some super advanced race that is God-like or the drive to become God-like, blah, blah, blah. It's always about God. Uh, Neuromancer is interesting in that uh, unlike what has become the trope today, uh, it has a positive view of like the possibility of an AI god. Uh, you know, the it's not much of a spoiler, <laughs> honestly. Uh, the AI at the end, you know, becomes a, a true, fully transcendent AI beyond the human uh, capacities to grasp. Uh, and uh, what does it do? Uh, it doesn't care about human beings that much. It doesn't find us that interesting. 
uh, what it finds interesting is not it doesn't start like experimenting or doing all kinds of crazy things and going like oh you know humans are kind of like a waste of time let's fuck up uh, what they're doing and do our own thing uh, no the AI is like a mystical person uh, it kind of becomes enlightened and it goes oh wow things are and they are as they are and I know why they are and uh, you know like there's not much that it says to the main character at the end it's just like well what do you do it's like well i contemplate things uh what things well everything and he's like what do you do like does it change anything well no in the end it doesn't change anything but it changes everything <laughs> and you know and it says well i only talk to my i spend my time talking to my own kind now you know it's found some signals from another ai that was that was from another star system that was communicating with it and so it was like trying to hold communication with it as well. Uh, kind of interesting, uh, a very weird, uh, optimistic uh, view of AI, which is refreshing now that today, every time, like, oh, the AI is going to become sentient and it's going to believe that we're all stupid and it's going to say, kill us all. <sighs> yeah, it's boring. Very boring. What else? What else is there to really say? There's not much to update. Uh, yeah, that's really it. You know, it's getting very dark. I'm about half an hour away from home, so I'm gonna head home. Uh, we'll see if I'll upload this. I probably will. I don't think this was too bad. Just a life update. See you around.